Yes, I can. Here we go. Are we recording? Yep. Yep. We're recording now. That must be Johnny. Hi, Johnny. How are you this morning? Can you hear us, Johnny? Seems to be frozen. Yeah, he was having that problem yesterday when we chatted. Oops, now he's gone. <laughs> now he's disappeared. So um, I kind of really uh, enjoyed this last piece of uh, Bateson. Yeah, it's funny. It's um, it's a, it's one of Bateson's arguments that I've been expecting all along. Yeah. And I, and I kind of given up that it was going to come out. <laughs> and here it is. <laughs> you, you get a sense how much Nora seems to speak through this too, or you know, she, you know, this is something that she's expanded. Yes, exactly. Father. I mean, he talks about adaptability, and she talks about learning, but they're really talking about the same thing. Well, and I just phraseology sometimes of the ecology of ideas and flexibility. Some yeah. of those things hit me as wow. That's a good way to kind of change the language that helps me think better, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So this idea of um, the, the, the way flexibility gets um, eaten up uh, over time by a complex system. So um, I used it actually at a couple of times in the course of my science career. Uh, yeah. w one, when I was looking at... Um, people with disability and, and, and well, the period after, for instance, somebody has a major accident and they are now in, uh -huh. in a situation of disability. Okay. And what happens is their range of flexible actions has been drastically reduced and they have to relearn how to introduce more flexibility into their living arrangements which the okay which the the issue the health issue is reduced right so this is a very batesonian idea that i picked up from reading these and then and applied okay. it in that context so right um uh, so i didn't i'm i did try i did rack my brains to come up with something more pizzazz to talk about Please. Okay, <laughs> but I didn't find anything. I got rather busy with some other projects right now. For, okay, uh, so um, I think I'm just going to. Oh, I I don't have a lot to say about this. I think your introduction, Michael, was as good as anything that I could have done. <laughs> oh wow! Thank you. <laughs> Did you summarize it? I missed your introduction. Did you say oh, sorry, something? It's just this idea that uh, this idea of flexibility is. And in the ecological uh, ecology of ideas common to Nora and Gregory Bateson in this piece. Uh, and what I was saying, you know, so I remember reading this thing about the flexibility. I think it was in Mind and Nature. I think he goes into it quite in quite a bit more detail in Mind and Nature. Yeah. And yeah. this is this is where it shows up. And I hadn't remembered it showed up at the very end of Steps to an Ecology of Mind. But... Uh, uh. Uh, I, I recall the um, the notion of the law of requisite variety. It, it, it was a sort yeah. of... Yeah. And the, it sort of implied that the most flexible component of a system will have most control. I think that was very early cybernetics because I don't think anyone really thinks anyone has any control <laughs> anymore about on, with complex systems but we do have a lot of influence and i think it's a shift from control to influence that registers for me the movement from a first order to perhaps a second order and maybe even a third order which i think is what nora sort of embodies in her book um whereas i believe uh gregory was still very much a pioneer and he was still working out, and he, that's why I'm looking at an author I just picked up again, uh, and I, Timothy Morton, um, being, eco, being ecological, 
and um, I think he's I think he's in the same ballpark. I don't know if that's the right metaphor because I don't like baseball, <laughs> but, um, but I think he's in the same ball moving towards something that neither one of them have a particularly good vocabulary for yet. Um, but, but they sort of know the early AI and cybernetics first order uh, is sort of been deconstructed. So they were looking now at systems where the subject and object is not at all uh, clear cut as it once was. And I think that's where our challenge is, is how do we learn how to talk about things when, um, you know, we took agency for granted is, you know, the subject and the object over there. I'm the, uh, I am the observer and I can intervene in the system in ways that I see fit for my purposes. Um, that's all been so totally called into question um, by uh, another generation of thinkers including ourselves. So I think he was to be applauded for the great contributions he's made. And rereading this book has been a revelation in many ways, because I think somehow, it, it, I think he, well, it's, I, I don't want to be ungrateful for the contributions that he's made. Um, and it's easy to be ungrateful. But I think that, um, what we're up against is so huge. Yeah. And uh, I think he had these, he thought we would get this down in 20 years, you know, maybe 10 or five, even five. I think he thought we would, with enough conferences, we could sort all these issues out. <laughs> I think 30 years after his death, we're nowhere near sorting any of this out. That's my feel. And I think the internet has only exacerbated our tendencies to, um, find ourselves in a, in a perpetual model. So it's sort of like, what are we going to do with this? Um, it's sort of held suspicion by some because they say, well, you can't do anything. Give up. <laughs> and uh, so, so just abolish, so just forget about all your action plans. Well, yeah, that's sort of hard to do when you're sort of hardwired in this, in this culture. If you don't know what you want to do, someone else will know what they want to do. And they're going to either instrumentalize you or they're going to uh, sh kick you in the balls and leave you on the side of the road. <laughs> I mean, you know, this is a very, um, at least where I'm living, it's a very, it's a very big machine and it chews people up and it spits them out every day. And if you don't have the capacity to figure out what that is you want, then you're going to be, you know, you're just going to be cannon fodder basically. Um, so anyway, I'm just sharing that with you guys because I find this postmodern drift, which is pretty epidemic among most people. It's like, oh, well, someone will figure this out. Let them figure it out. Um, why isn't someone doing something? Um, and I think it's a great relief to me that the, recently we've had these, uh, the good news that the, the state of New York is, is, is green now. And um, this was took decades to make this happen. And I think there are five or six other states, including California, that have gone green. When the two biggest wealthiest states, California and New York, both want something, they may have to wait a while, but usually everyone else who wants to do business with California or New York, which is global, they have to make, they have to adapt um, to the new kind of standards that are they're gonna quickly be replacing the old standards of the of the fuel fuel based economy. Um, so it'll be. I'm not claiming that it's going to be easy uh, from now on, but I think um, there's a, a whole lot to be um, grateful for. Um, that these new trends, I think, are becoming not just marginalized um, voices on you know, who have been perhaps shrilly proclaiming um, the disaster up ahead. But I think it's all pretty much, you know, we're all holding this in, um, in reasonable ways now. And I believe that, um, you know, those who are opposed to one another are starting to 
you know, wake up and just start to, you know, create new kinds of coalitions. Uh, so anyway, that's my spiel. I don't have a, but I, I'm a, I am aware of these, uh, that uh, I'm running out of gas, personally. I'm pooped out. <laughs> I'm tired of all of this. I want to like retire, kick back, you know, um, with my pile of books and let the young people take care of this. Um, but I also realized that there are, young, there are young, a lot of young people who are not going to take care of anything or anybody. So it's foolish to think you can just, uh, you know, pick up golf or some new hobby and that um, you don't have to learn anything new. Um, because I think that's the, the, the skills that are going to be required. I, it's going to be required of every, it's an intergenerational kind of thing. And um, um, anyway, and I think Nora is exquisitely aware of this. And I think Gregory was as well. So I'm just going to press the pause button. I think I've said enough that I really want to applaud all of us for showing up for these, for these um, calls and for doing the readings. And it's been um, a labor of love for me. I have really enjoyed it. And I'm so thankful to all of you for your input and your insights and understandings and your perplexity because I think that's um, contributed enormously to the aesthetic relationships that I believe are, are going to, to be the drivers for the, this, third, this third wave, whatever that might be. But I think a lot of us are, are, are feeling the vibe. So thank you. And I'm gonna go get my coffee. Because <laughs> <laughs> of course it's 20 weeks is, uh you know, a significant commitment of time and effort, right? Uh, yeah, I, it is. I, I sure. felt it over the course of the time. It hasn't always been an easy thing to come to these sessions. Uh, yeah. Because life tends to take over at times, and and it has been very stressful at times. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and it's a challenging book to read. I mean... Um, I think in a, in a way, it's even more challenging to read as a group than individually, because individually, if you don't get it, you just slide over it and you read on the next piece. But <laughs> That's as a group, true. That's you true. can't get away with that. You have to no. stop and, and try no. and struggle with every piece as you go, which is yeah. both the advantage and the disadvantage of it. And uh, you find out also that, oh, well, if I don't understand it, it's because it's just over my head and that's okay. Somebody else understands it. But what I find out is that's not true. Nobody understands this. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, uh, we'd, we'd be very lucky if somebody did, but nobody, nobody has a clue. We're yeah, up against yeah. no map. And, and my experience, what I come to this for is to challenge my understanding by listening to your understanding. Oh, I think so that's, that's, why we, that's why we're in infinite conversations. Yeah, I haven't stopped being challenged in the year, in the yeah. two, almost two years now that I've been involved in this site. Yeah, and then and I think a core value of that that runs through human history, as far as I understand it, is, and Jeffrey, you've kind of talked, maybe not put this word on it, but I feel you, it, it resonates with this word of humility, openness, you know, um, and you know, John, I I I totally agree about how you describe being overwhelmed and whether, you know, what's going to happen next to whatever, you know, I totally get that vibe. Um, but by me coming here and, and ch doing the challenging, what I find interesting is, is for me, it really has helped me given me skill not to necessarily let despair or, even grief, because I told you yesterday, I, I lost a cousin and my my son is moving. And so besides the world get being fucked up, everything's changing in my life right now. Um, but coming to these cafes, and I do have a few people that I do talk to, just, I guess, the act of talking about it helps modulate the overwhelm. And also, I, I, I just have to kind of bring in my Zen notion. Uh, one thing Zen teaches you, you know, and, and Buddhism is things are impermanent and, and you need to learn how to ride that wave, how to work with it. So that from my angle as an ethical being, 
how much am I contributing to the per se maybe negative part of the cha what's changing and how much am I just not contributing to it but maybe just adding more like I'll give you a concrete example that I think really um, speaks to what you just spoke to John but from my perspective I was on the street yesterday and there's a homeless person a lady that I've seen around and we we nod at each other we know each other that way and she was I, I happened to see her and I happened to see how much distress she was in she was really hurting and she lives on the street she she definitely has some medical issues and she asked to use my phone so that she could call 911 uh, to get help and that and I, I just took it upon myself in a small way to do that the other that we've talked about of reaching out and I don't know if that's got you know I have to in Zen you have to give up whatever the outcome of that might be I won't know it you know I only know the outcome of how it it actually slowed me down and made me feel good And this is one thing I like about the, and I'm I'm being activated by Bateson's words of of flexibility, of ideas, of being flexible, and at least in my own system, paying attention to how that flexibility can uh, get spent, <laughs> as he would put it, you know. So that's that's what I take away from listening to you john and uh the readings and uh you jeffrey over the time i've been coming here i also think uh to come back to what you were saying johnny about um i i agree with you that uh, back in the 70s 80s when Bateson was still active um I think it was more, I don't think he necessarily believed the future was going to be as difficult as it is, but I think it was more hopeful or wishful, you know, or, or putting things on the positive spin. Um, because, and the, because part of the problem, of course, that we are in is that, um, is that I mean, this book and, uh, and some of his other books and Nora Bateson's work and for that matter, Mary Catherine Bateson's work as well. Um, they're all kind of tools to do stuff, but most people aren't paying attention to these kinds of tools. No. Uh, and, you know, this is part of the reason why I wanted to read this book as a, as a public group effort to get, you know, some sort of discussion out online because these tools need to come to the fore um, there's more need for this kind of focus now than there ever, ever has been. And, uh, and, and so, I, you know, I, and, and to some extent, you know, I mean, why are things in such a mess? Well, Bateson's arguments analysis has some, uh, has some answers. I mean, not necessarily directly the way he wrote them, but if you apply the lessons, to our current situation, you still get some fairly clear answers about what the, you know, and Nora does that in her, in her own book, right? So um, about what the problems are and how one solves them. And, and you know, it's not going to be an easy solve, that's for sure. Um, I do also want to have one comment about uh, the New York and California thing, because um, in a way, because the, the shift is away from national politics to solve the world's problems. And that is a good thing because I think as long as people were assuming that things were going to be solved at the national level, nothing was going to get done. And yeah. shifting it to state or regional levels, that's where the leadership's going to come. It's not going to come at the national level. Look at all the dorks who are sitting in power, all, not just Trump, but everywhere in the world. <coughs> Right. <clears throat> There's nobody in leadership, almost nobody in leadership, in the political world. Uh, so I don't think we're gonna we're gonna get our answers there. You know? I and I think it's maybe local politics is much more. It's more important who you're, 
who your mayor is than it is who the president is. Certainly if you're yeah. in a city like New York, yeah. voting for the mayor is more important than who's the president. Trump is a very minor figure in terms of what's going on. Uh, like New York City, of course, is a, is a huge city and the mayor of New York has a lot of clout. But I think that's when the mayors of all these cities get together and they uh, forge alliances, it changes uh, the governorship of the state. It changes what's happening at the national, the national discourse starts to change. So um, I noticed that uh, in the recent elections, and I think I've said this before and I'll say it again, and I don't know who I'm quoting here, but electoral politics is like wiping your ass. <laughs> you do it just so you can, hopefully to keep the fascists out, but that's not where the real politics is happening. And I think that's true. Uh, and I think it's, and I think this is something that um, uh, I think Nora and, and Gregory uh, appreciate um, that, uh, you know, they, these, that we're all sort of, we all have this idea that the self is sort of a circle and with a dot in the middle. <laughs> and, then, and that you're looking from that little vantage point of the dot to the edges of that circle yeah. And, and you're really cozy there. Yeah. Now we're realizing there is no line, there is no circle that's solid. It's much more like perforated. It's perforated and it's open and there are things coming in and coming out. And that little dot where you thought you could safely view everything, it's, it's, uh, comes in and out of focus. Um, and I think that's, and uh, every other system is like that too. So, all of these systems are, have, um, they're, they're like open. And so there's a, a kind of an individuality, but it's an open individuality. And so the, all those I, values that we learned, like being autonomous, deciding what you want and going out to get it, is, uh, is partial at best and psychotic at worst. So I think that's where we're sort of, having to recognize, especially in America, I don't know about Canada, but certainly in America, how that, uh, that kind of individualism, which I think uh, Trump sort of uh, is a parody of, <clears throat> is just not workable anymore. Um, and that, but I, that doesn't mean we all have a clear idea. That, that I don't think means we should just forget about uh, having goals or desires um, and live a, a desire-free life in some sort of, Buddhistic haze. Oh, that's for sure. That's just yeah. been come challenged tremendously. Yeah. So there, I think the the fragility of the self is uh, it, it can be, of course, being open and uh, you know uh, permeable is great, uh, but it can lead to dissolution very quickly, and and that ain't pretty. You don't want to be around someone who doesn't have a self. <laughs> Believe me, it's it's not a good thing. And I think that's where um, a, a lot of people who may have plenty of money and don't have to worry too much can have the luxury of talking that way. Yeah. Uh, down in the street, uh-uh. You know, yeah. we don't have that luxury. And I'm, on the, I'm, I'm very close to the street um, and rather than the boardrooms. <clears throat> yeah. And I know I've worked for the people who, who are in the boardroom. And I know they don't know how to open a can of tuna fish. <laughs> you know? And if the elevator, uh, if, if they push the, the button at the elevator and the elevator is work, they are clueless. They don't know what to do. And they get oh, frustrated. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's, they're living more and more in a very, very fragile world where, you know, they're going to press the button and nothing's going to happen. Well, and it makes then, sense. They're high off the ground. <laughs> yeah. So it's like the janitors and the maintenance people and the, the people who know how to, to cook and to sew and to, uh, and who, and, and for those of us who memorize things um, or who really study and read really hard, you know, do that really heavy lifting that comes from actually reading an entire book rather than surfing a thousand, um, uh, you know, a thousand articles. I think that, um, that's, uh, those are kind of basic skills that I, I fear are getting lost. Um, and I think this, that's because I'm reading um, Timothy Morton right now. And I've read him before, and I do find him frustrating. 
But I think he makes a distinction that I think is helpful. He talks about the difference between a fact and a factoid. And he says, we have, and I think this comes from that, a, a previous uh, sort of belief maybe many of us held that is being, um, but the idea of a fact is like a barcode that you can just pass over a scanner and it's all going to go to an, into a computer and it's all going to be registered magis, mag, magically. It's just going to all be there. Um, but he says the fa facts are not like barcodes. Someone has to come along and figure out what, that fact, what the facts are. And unfortunately, we're living with so many people who are making claims that they have facts when what they actually have are factoids. They look like facts, but they really are not facts at all. They're just sort of a, a combination of a lot of, different, uh, a, a lot of different data that's been gathered and is, has not been sorted out in terms of the different scales. So information coming in, data coming in from different scales. Um, and then, so it's sort of like a fact, but it's not quite, but I'm gonna present it as if it were a fact. And that's where I think we're in these battle, these these battles uh, between those who are deny who are who are deny who are the deniers and those who are uh, shrilly uh, attacking those who are in denial. But he's basically saying we're all we're all sort of in, in, immersed in these factoids, and um, you know, and facts change. Let's face it. You know, I think that the, the the kind of scientism that he's Morton is railing against, and I think that Bateson was as well, and Nora, Nora and Gregory, were both recognizing this, that facts just don't grow on trees and you just go over there and pick it off and take a bite out of it. Um, and that, um, you know, we can't easily separate our facts from what our values are. But, but all of this is sort of um, a result of the fact that um, the, um the world of information has become huge. Uh, back in the days when information was confined to books and newspapers and what you said to another real person in the street, um, you know, these things, they were there, but they were down in the minority, but, but information has become huge. And, and I think a lot of the, well, we're in a sort of shaking out period for how to deal with with all of these perversities in the information world because because it wasn't huge before they were there but they were minor and 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 minor things have become huge today right so they get amplified the perversities too we know that so that's right um, yeah so so i think at um generalizations distortions um they've always been with us but now those generalizations and distortions get amplified in ways they've never been able to be amplified before. And so then you get, um, you know, psychotic persons that would have been on the margins of society and not a big, big threat are now running large corporations and, and governments. <laughs> yeah, so I think exactly. that's the, uh, and that's tricky. That's very tricky. And they're manufacturing factoids left and right to justify policies and um so i think it's a uh, it is a major miracle that there have been uh, enough people who've gathered enough data of both of living systems and warm data i think that's what um nora calls um if we could gather enough warm data and data from living actual living systems then I believe we could, um, you know, create something that's that's useful for for more of us than not. But um, that's tricky. That's tricky because we are addicted to those that path dependency, fossil fuels and the gross national product. Um, in one of our calls, we talked to Dave Verlaufler, who's a um, he's a theorist. He's um, he works in Germany. But I read one of his articles and I had a few interviews with him and, uh, and TJ was on some of those calls. 
I don't think you were there, Michael, but I don't know if you're familiar no. with Babe Lockler. At any rate, he talks about the yam. He talks about um, there's a, a society that really valued the yam and they sort of made it a, a cultural um, habit uh, or, a, or a reward was given to whoever could grow the largest yam. So this became what happened. And over generations, the yams got bigger and bigger and bigger until they had no nutritional value whatsoever. Mm-hmm. So the, the community started to, were on borderline starvation because they had gotten addicted to this idea that the bigger the yam, better it was for everybody. And that was not true. Mm-hmm. And I think the same thing here is operating with our, you know, addiction to fossil fuels and our idea of the, 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 of the gross national product, the myth of unlimited growth, um, these kinds of drivers uh, behind our current economy <clears throat> are leading us very quickly off the edge. And I think we all sort of ag- are in pretty much agreement about this. Um, but it's very hard to redirect our attention to something else that might might be warmer data or more uh, com- um, more congruent with living systems when we um, don't know exactly what that is going to look like or sound like or feel like. It's not concrete enough for enough people to redirect their attention, mm-hmm. even though they're pretty much in despair about the current current paradigm. They 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 know most everybody does. I think at this point that we're in we're in real trouble, but they can't. They don't have anything to replace it with. And I think the best we can do probably um, is to just recognize this tension and to honor it and to acknowledge that, well, we don't have anything to replace it with yet. Um, But that doesn't mean that it's working, that the current paradigm is working and you should just continue to promote it or, you know, do this lockstep kind of, um, you know, in, you know, so I think that's the hard that's the hard thing for our personal ecologies. How do we figure that out? Um, and how many people can we get? How many people can get online with what you're talking about? Because that's an element. And I was just thinking when you were describing the new yam is how much information can we gather? It's information that's the new yam, and 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 we're having to learn. <clears throat> You know, another element with this is the paradox of of embracing that we're open systems, but there is with openness comes extreme, a lot more uncertainty. That's right. That's you know, right. and so and ambiguity too. And ambiguity, and so this is a new this is this is a a, a new way of thinking, feeling, being of being uh, of like learning how to navigate or sail if you are just a land animal you you've got certain skills there there may be some skills from land that can transfer you know because uh Bateson talks about some things you know ideas that come forward that we can use but this movement that we're you're talking about so well and and, and jeffrey and i think Bateson is it's it's a new dance john it's a new dance, and you know, you know, we know very well how much uh, tension is lear- learning a new dance with your body that's used to. And I'm associating body with our ideas and our thought systems, uh, bringing challenge and uh, you know, flexing it, trying to, and you know, God bless a lot of people on the street, and I uh, I hold them dearly, but I I have to accept they don't have the same inspiration as I do for reasons of their own right if I can I'd like to put it that way because I, I it's developmental but I don't want to be judgmental right. and we also had this idea back in Bateson's day 70s 80s whatever um, that um, that the right arguments would float to the top Oh shit! Yeah, you remember oh, that? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> and now, I was a victim of that. I was a victim of that. <laughs> and now we understand that no, 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 they don't float. In fact, it's the other ones that float to the top. <laughs> and we, one has to struggle, and one has to t- treat the whole thing of 
uh, of defending arguments and 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 making them finding ways to make right arguments, yeah. you know, grounded, evidence based, you know, well thought out ideas. Yeah, but they have to be. It's a it's a it's a it's a it's a fight in a way. It's a fight to bring them. Yeah, it reminds me of Jimmy Cliff's uh, Jimmy Cliff's song "Struggling Man." If you've ever listened to that, <laughs> "Struggling Man's Gonna Struggle." <laughs> but I think the whole idea of peer review is being called into question, and um, I know you're at the. The, the forefront of this, Jeffrey, because you're an educator. Um, and I think this is, well, but for everybody, if you're a parent or you want to um, have some influence, um, I, I mean, one of the biggest drivers has always been for humanity to transmit culture to the next generation mm -hmm. uh, as parents, as educators, whatever, or whatever capacity you have. Um, but I think it's, well, what is it that we're passing on? And I think it's something that Nora is very sensitive to, um, that it's, uh, it's intergenerational. And I think all the generations that are on the planet right now uh, have to co-refer to one another in ways that we've never had to do. Mm -hmm. And um, because, it, because the best ideas do not rise up to the top, and the best ideas that rise up to the top are not held by the elders who then can transmit it to the younger generations in, in clear and pristine ways. That's not the way it's happening anymore. And I think that's uh, good news and bad news. Because um, it means that a lot of us who are older and who've been in the trenches for a long time, we may be fighting battles that are, have already been decided. And we need to unlearn a lot of things. And just like a dancer who may be a, trained as a ballerina, if she wants to do modern dance, because no one wants to watch ballets anymore, She's going to have to unlearn a lot of techniques that she in mastered. Her, in her muscles, in her muscles. That's right. And she's got to unlearn so she can learn new, to make new steps. And I'm not a dancer, but I've known lots of dancers. And I've noticed that uh, those who have uh, careers that span beyond just a, a decade have to be extremely flexible in, you know, how they, you know, once they learn something, they got it. But then another choreographer comes wrong and you're going to have to learn new techniques real fast if you want to have a, a career that's going to uh, last for a while and of course dancers have a, a a short shelf life perhaps compared to other kind of professions um, but I think it's an interesting um, idea and I think that we're all to some extent you know because of the information explosion becoming obsolete so quickly and I see young people, it's terrible. They don't know what to study or what's important because what difference does it make? It's gonna be obsolete next month. So uh, a lot of skills, I think, uh, that are hard to acquire, but are worthwhile having, like being able to read well, um, are getting sort of, uh, we're getting, we're losing that. We're losing some of that, those skills. I find that very frustrating. Uh, as an actor, um, when I was performing at my best, I was in my 20s and my early 30s. And um, I was, uh, but then I got tired of that scene uh, and I left acting, but it's still, there's still a part of me that knows how to perform. And I, I felt it was a, a real privilege for me and Doug and Michael yesterday to sit, sit together in one of our conference calls and uh, do some Shakespeare together. You know, take a little a short text marvelous. and just sort of like open it up, unpack it, warm up our voices and try to re-embody that uh, Shakespeare. And that's a skill. Um, and it's something that anyone can learn who has the interest. But it's uh, also something that uh, does require some perseverance. And I, I feel I see the lack of that kind of basic skill and people don't know how to scan a text. People don't know um, in, in whether it's poetry or prose. It, it becomes a little frustrating because they've watched too many newscasters, uh, you know, on the evening news. Um, you know, and 
a lot of information has been thrown at them, but very, very little of it has been embodied by anybody. And that's what I like about, the, about these calls is we can read a lot of information, but we get together and we try to put it into our own words. And then we realize um, what we, what's, uh, what, what is more stable and what's more unstable and going back and forth between those zones of stability and zones of instability. And um, I think it's that what's happening in the in-between, which is that transcontextual space that's very ambiguous between disciplines and disciplinarians, I mean. That I, that I think is very, very rich. And I think this is something that Nora <coughs> does well. And I think that uh, Gregory does really well is this, uh, it's not going to be... In, the, in any one discipline, but the interplay of, of many different kinds of disciplines, and maybe discipline is not the right word for what's going on now. Um, um, because, uh, you know, I think our academia is sort of in, you know, crisis, and the humanities and the sciences, or it looks like the sciences or scientism has gobbled up the humanities. Uh, evidently, a lot of humanities, um, I understand that a lot of humanities. Uh, are in real peril. So I think these are the kind of challenges because those, those are the, of us who love literature and love uh, beautiful speech and clear writing, we have to sort of maybe give up on a lot of that because, you know, um, and, and that's sad to say because I don't, I have a real, I don't know what kind of literature is going to come uh, out of this of this interplay of all of these different kinds of uh, modalities and different kinds of technologies. Um, and what kind of storytelling um, is going to come out of all of this? That's going to be, that isn't just going to be more and more decohering. Um, anyway, that, that I think is an ongoing challenge for me personally, but I think it's very, very rewarding just to have these platforms or these, spaces that we're creating together to try to make sense as Nora says and maybe if we make enough sense more often than not we'll have a chance at making some meaning together and uh, which I believe we've done on more than when we're at our best I think we're doing this well and I think the the making sense part is really important to get in touch with because of recent readings with Carney you know right. uh, uh, because, okay, so I'm going to go where I sometimes go as my experience with trauma. Trauma that I experienced, and I think everybody in different degrees, you can't get through life without experiencing some, it's just a matter of degree of trauma. In the sense that your sense-making ability has been disrupted. It's been changed. It's 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 been destabilized. That's right. And I think these kind of things and, and the kind of work I've done is to go, okay, but that's, that's not the end. I don't have to stay stuck in destabilization. Uh, going off of Bateson, uh, acknowledging the error, that's a big part. There's a self-corrective that I think, to speak to what you're saying, John, there's not enough talk about or mentoring. There is a self-corrective to help people there is a healing not a cure right. i don't believe in fucking cures i do believe in healing healing because what it does it, it it it's part of the evolutionary uh fire too is to take what appears to be messy and turn it into something else right and that's un there's an uncertainty in that but that isn't that part of art isn't that a big part of the aesthetic I think it's the big that, part that's, of on, that's online all over the place. That's what I've noticed. The sense of the aesthetic, whatever it is, and I may have my own taste, but the sense of the aesthetic feels like the 60s. There was an element of that in the 60s that is part of trying to help us move through this fucking volcano messiness. So, just, you know, I think, to, go I ahead. I'd just like to say that we should give Doug a, a, a hello yes, and, yes, and, and a chance to enter the discussion. Yeah. <laughs> Romeo, yeah. Romeo, wherefore art thou, Romeo? <laughs> good call, Jeffrey. <laughs> good, good morrow to all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Pardon my delay. Um, but today, and 
I hope you don't mind me telling telling some minor stories that are going on in my life that Please. may or may not relate to what's going on here, but I think I received the transmission of the first 30 or so minutes. And um, But I, I, I'm glad you brought up destabilization, Michael. I, I might have mentioned in another call, I, I'm destabilized right now. My sleep patterns on top of a one-year-old one transitioning, weaning, weaning off of uh, his mother uh, is having late night issues. I'm also driving my father-in-law at 10.30 each night to his place of work since we only have one vehicle and he can't drive. He doesn't have a license and all that. He, he'll have to learn English and pass tests and do all that. That's probably a year long process if, if not more. So I'm feeling destabilized. My dream work, my, my day has been affected. And um, I, maybe mentally I, I'm, I'm at a place that's okay, but my body is, does feel some sort, sort of trauma or, or destabilization. I'm, I'm shaking right now. I'm trying to stand up so I, I'm not sitting down all day. <laughs> so I can leap around. But um, there's... There's a lot going on in the world, and my my world is one small perspective, but th there's 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 another thing that's going on in the house today, which may sound strange to some people, but we we have six chickens, and my tatai uh, father-in-law will be killing one of them today. We got approval from my son, uh, who. <laughs> who says he doesn't want any of them to, to die, but he's not that attached to where they're like pets or something. But um, I've witnessed the, there's no official ritual, but it is a process and it is done carefully with care, with respect, I think. Um, not tortured, no, none of that. Um, but it's the process of sustenance, of taking another life to bring sustenance when this, this is where I'm imagining the outside world. And for anyone that eats chicken, you're purchasing it in a foam package with plastic wrapping. That alone right there is enough to um, end the treatment of these animals, unless you're buying organic free range. Um, the treatment of these animals is quite poor. And that we've lost touch to our ecology, to our environment. To the point that we've, you know, we're, it may have stabilized our, our um, intake of food, but it's destabilizing the entire world. J just the ideal, uh, idea of animal husbandry, and that's the, I think the term that's used for, for raising livestock is husbandry, which is another paternalistic term. And so that's kind of the taking of the earth and making it our own. Um, I don't want to steer too far in any direction, but I, I listen to, um, and I want to read a book by Eduardo Cohn, um, who- How Forests Think. Right. Or, um, and- It's a good the talk, one. The talk sounds very interesting and it, it's akin to Donna Haraway, um, and Bateson as well of- taking into account the ecological and, and, and perhaps even tying in with Gebser, the, the lost mythology that, or, or any Kearney, Richard Kearney, um, almost anyone we're exploring right now is tying in these, these lost dimensions. Gary Lockman is another one, the lost yeah. imagination. So in this mess of a world, how do we reestablish our relationship with the world around us. And I'd like to think that it was mentioned that, I don't know exactly how you guys phrased it, but our, our education um, is pretty poor and we can go in all sorts of directions. But for some reason I, I was thinking of each idea or thought as a child. And if you imagine how children are brought into the world nowadays, it's there, there are people bringing their children into the world simply because they know the state will support 
their child or they'll get more tax return on that. Um, I know that from direct experience. So I'm thinking even, even physically, the children we bring into the world right now, um, I don't want to go as far as um, some bumper sticker I saw that um, we've got to stop the stupid people from breeding. That's a little bit um, extreme and pessimistic or nihilistic. But, it, but. Uh, and how, who determines who is stupid? Right, exactly. So that's the direction I want to steer clear of. So I don't want to get into that territory, but it, it does seem like those who have given deeper thought to raising children in the world have stopped having children in the world, which means um, those that haven't given thought to raising children in the world are still having children in the world. So we need to take that into account as um, we populate these ideas, um, how are good ideas spread. Um, I think breeding Bateson is one way, um, taking Bateson out into the world is another process altogether. Yeah, that's true. I, I might have steered the direction of the conversation in a, a strange territory there. So take take that little tidbit. And, uh, oh, that's it. all right, Doug. It's all grist for the mill. We all like strange territories, so. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Good one, Jeffrey. <laughs> that, that's about all I wanted to say. I could keep keep going on, but I don't want to at this point. Speaking of um, sewing, I'm I'm unpicking a, a garment. <laughs> oh wow! Oh, wow! You said unpicking, so you're yeah. Well, it, it's a garment I'm working on, and I I want to correct some of the seams, so I'm unpicking them so I can read it. Again. Well, we're doing a lot of intertwingling, right, John? That's right. <laughs> I, I mean. To some extent, I suppose Bateson is a kind of an unpicker, right? Yeah, yeah. He picks at the seams of things, right? Yes, that's <laughs> a good, a good observation. Yeah. So, go ahead, Doug. And I'll pass it on to John. He wanted to talk. No, I love that book you just mentioned. How forests think. Uh, and is I there think anything you haven't read, Johnny? Oh, <laughs> I, I bet. I've, I've re, I have scanned, I've skimmed a lot of things, but to actually read is a I, I, I still don't know where you find the time. I mean, I know you're kind of retired, but still, I just don't understand where you find the time to read everything that you do. <laughs> I, don't, I don't either. I think I'm driven by a, a daemon. Um, it just keeps me um, at a feverish pace. Uh, that doesn't mean I've integrated very much of it. I, I think that's the challenge as I get older is, uh, you know, maybe who it was Fanny Bryce. She has a conversation in one of those movies uh, with Barbara Streisand. She plays the great comedian, Fanny Bryce. She's talking to her, her mother who's, who's Jewish is dispensing Jewish wisdom. All. And she says to her daughter, who's perplexed about her husband, who's a gambler. And the, um, the, the mother-in-law or the, the, the mother says to her, darling, everybody knows he's a drowning man. Everybody knows this. And she says, but Ma, I love him. And she says, love him less, help him more. <laughs> that is such a beautiful thing. Um, but I think there's a, uh, a lot of these, um, I think that we're in this, in the midst of, well, what do we love? What do we love? And how do we love what we love? Yes. And just yes. by lavishing praise upon someone we love, it's not the best way sometimes. Sometimes we have to kick ass. <laughs> sometimes we have to blow a whistle and say foul. You know, yeah. and these are the kind of, um, and this is love also. And when someone is triggered and is regressing in a, into a, a, into a defensive mode, because we all, we all are suffering from post-traumatic stress on a grand scale. I think I'm drawing from, um, 
um, this previous author I quoted here. Yeah, it's, inter it's intergenerational too. Yeah, this is a major trauma where, and no one's, no one's going to escape from it or think they're in, there's a, there's a, a trauma-free zone where they're going to be safe. Um, so I think what we're dealing with is, um, you know, those kinds of tensions um, in our relationships. And you're mentioning how tired you are, Doug. I'm very tired too. I, have had, I haven't slept well in the last two nights. And I, I usually sleep pretty well, but um, I've been sleeping poorly as well. And, um, <clears throat> you know, it's what those, uh, those, those insomniac nights, or if you've gone, what happens to me is I sometimes wake up too early. And I think, oh, wow, I'm awake, I'm ready to go. And then an hour later, I realize, oh, no, you're not ready to go. You need more sleep, <laughs> but you're already awake. Mm -hmm. And I think that's uh, a different kind of thing from tossing and turning uh, at night because I don't have that problem, fortunately. I, you know, I usually try to turn off my computer or get myself into a space where I'm pretty relaxed so that I can go into sleep uh, quickly and easily. And that usually is the case. But I think that um, it's rare for me when I'm underslept, but I think it's the norm for large groups of people, especially if they're being pumped up artificially by these, by these devices that they're addicted to. And uh, I worry. I worry about people who celebrate the fact that, oh, I, you know, I don't need eight hours sleep. I can get by with six. And I'm saying, no, you can't. <laughs> That's <laughs> not true. You need eight, maybe 10. Children need 10 to, to really function well. Uh, it cognitively impairs them to get up too early. And I think that there's some school systems are talking about rather than, uh, you know, having uh, the start of school an hour later so that the kids can sleep an hour, uh, right. hour longer. It's better for them cognitively to right. fun function better with that extra hour sleep than an extra hour of uh, instruction. So I think these are the kind of problems that we're having, and, that, and it's basic about rhythms. We, we, we're addicted to trying to crack a code rather than catch rhythm. And our, our inability to pick up on other people's rhythms, when they're tired, when they're hungry, when they're grouchy, when they're open to new ideas because they're well-rested and they've had enough to eat. Yeah, and, and, and playing, with multiple, yeah. playing with multiple rhythms. This is, rather than chunking it down, I mean, in the bad sense, chunking it down to, oh, we have to live at one rhythm all the time. That's right, that's right. You know, fast, um, fast, fast. Faster is uh, better. Mainly, mainly, uh, mainly fast, and you know, according, you know, I get everything you say about sleep, but, and I've had that issue too, but I've taken to modeling my sleep after a cat. I mean, I may only get four hours sleep at night, but I come home and I usually have two hours, three hours sleep, but it, I, I at least feel the rhythm when I need to, when I'm out, I know I'm tired. Okay, it's time to go home, lay a horizontal, see if I go to sleep, you know, just take care of myself because sometimes there, sometimes without dismissing what you're saying, John, we also don't know how to rest, just rest, not necessarily sleep. So I'm not trying to argue sleep's not needy, but we don't even have that rest. Just like in music, there's a pause, there's a rest with our own, I mean, in the physicality of resting without necessarily falling asleep. So that's what I work with as far as what you were just talking about. That and way. I think, and I, I, I think I've, I've said this before and I know it's a bit outrageous, but I don't think the next frontier, we're sort of running out of frontier. Um, <laughs> And I think this creates a lot of paranoia in some people because they think, oh, we need spaceships and we need to go out into outer space. I think the next frontier is sleep. I don't think we've explored that yet. And I think, and also we don't, we, we, we seem to know more about what's happening on Mars than we do what's happening in the core of the earth or the oceans. We don't know what's underneath. Um, so I think those are the kind of, those are the kind of areas that I find really, really interesting. You know what I like about your bringing it to sleep is it's a Alan, rhythm. Yeah. Yeah. It would, not only that, but Alan Watts said that mentioned that if we could trust falling asleep, we'd probably be comfortable with death. Well, I can't. I can't figure out what the difference is. I mean, really, 
I know <laughs> people have died uh, clinically or dead, but I talk to them all the time. <laughs> it's not a problem. But, and I think it's that that liminal zone of going uh, of being more porous to more of reality, and then. Uh, from listening to you, having the skills of moving in that other domain. That's right. Say. That's right. You know, and right. I think there we do need skills of when we move in there because, and and this may be tied to just survival mechanism, the survival mechanism that wants to stay alive, and then part of it, according to Freud, and I'm just riffing off it. We do have a death instinct in the sense, you know, we we know we're going to die, but uh working with that uh that edge state i guess i would say of opening closing you know almost like our breath you know of being more relaxed with that that uh two-way movement if i can put it that way on not i i it's all the way up it's not just physical it includes wherever you want to go with it well, I think the um, uh, moving from a monophasic to a polyphasic culture would be to appreciate um, other rhythms besides the the, the uh, you know the very fast um, rhythms that you know where a lot of innovation happens, but it's those slower rhythms that are deeper and that can consolidate those fat, what's happening in those faster rhythms. That's why we need those uh, activity rest cycles, which are run about every 90 minutes. Um, and why we also have other rhythms like 24 hour cycles as well. And there's monthly cycles, but I think there's these, uh, the overvaluation of one kind of rhythm. Yes. The expense of all the other rhythms is why our factory model educations, we've gone over this before. And I think it's so, so important is, um, creating so much fragmentation um, because we don't let kids space out. It's pay attention, do this, look up here, look at me, follow these instructions, go out and do this assignment. And if the kid wants to yawn and stretch and look out the window, that's bad. Um, and I think the, the yawn and the stretch and the looking out the window is absolutely physiologically installed at a very deep level. We need periods of relaxation and rest so that we can cognitively function. Right. So, even even yeah, in the middle of learning. Ourselves. Even you in the middle of learning a lesson. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Right. Right. Um, right. But um, I well, I like what you say about rest, uh, Michael. Um, but I'm you know I'm thinking that um, because we live in a society. I agree. We live in a society where people are endemically have undersleep. The problem with an endemic undersleep is that you close your eyes and you don't rest. You're going to fall asleep because... Yes, no, because you're, right. you're right. And, and so rest is something that happens if you have enough sleep, you can rest. But if you don't have enough sleep, you'll never rest. You'll just fall asleep. You know? right. That's, a, That's right. <laughs> right. Right. So how, do we, so how can we make meaning when we can't make sense? Because physiologically, we have oh, we have disturbed our these rhythms. Um, I don't know how flexible that we we are at changing these rhythms, and there are some people who just think we can override them, maybe with drugs or certain kinds of stimulation. Um, but stimulation is is going in the sense of fast. <laughs> well, not. I, I, I'm a, a proponent of the idea of hibernation, which I'm still <laughs> thinking through, but um, animals are still conscious during hibernation, or they come in and out of that state. And you can imagine yourself just allowing yourself to relax for the evening. I don't know, have a nice hot cup of tea, take a warm bath, uh, allowing yourself that space and shutting off whatever this fast paced notion is. Um, people take that step, but it, it's kind of a one-time mentality, like a one-night hibernation. And But there's records of meditators and individuals, people that do dream work, 
being they're conscious during the deep sleep states and that maybe that's where john's talking like the sleep is the area we need to tap into if we want to save ourselves so to speak um so it is a a halting a stopping um but hibernation is probably the wrong term but i'm gonna stick with it but maybe it's more of a conscious hibernation where maybe you're not officially in a dream state but but there is something to be had or said about getting to that point where you shut down or reset and then pr that that's where the most creative work comes from or the deepest rest comes from and that that's something i think we can all do to a certain extent well i, I want to go back to jeffrey's point because i think it's a good point a very excellent point but my uh working with that not enough sleep and needing to get sleep without rest. One of the ways I feel creatively I've taken to kind of bringing in the, that rest stop Jeff uh, rest point Jeffrey is I ride the bus a lot. So there's times when I'm just sitting still waiting for the bus. So mentally I've taken to just that micro resting meditative state as being part of my day in a micro it, it kind of goes to the micro practices we were going to talk about at one point you know a while back we said something about that so i guess i'm just trying to interject uh uh so that we don't just vacillate back and forth that there could be a healthy disruption of a uh, micro practice of at least sensing uh being open to a moment of feeling restfulness like i do at a bus stop when i'm waiting for a bus well i think that um i think there are different kinds of facts and facts don't grow on trees and and, and a fact is not um, like a barcode where you can just scan it and um, acquire the benefits of those facts. Uh, I think this is drawing from what uh, Timothy Morton is calling the difference between facts and factoids, where we're just sort of manufacturing, um, we're just gathering data and generating factoids, which, which is something that looks like a fact. And we're acting as if it is a fact, but it's actually um, you know, just lots of generalizations and distortions amplified a million times and presented uh, to the public as, as if it's a peer-reviewed, evidence-based. Um, yeah, right, right. And, and I think that's a, a challenge because, and also we, are, we should be, I think, forever skeptical of experts being able to figure this all out on our behalf um, because there's no expert who's going to be expert in enough disciplines to make the the kinds of policies that are going to deal with these, with the complexities of our, of, you know, of living systems. So I think what we need is the, that, those imaginal realms. I believe uh, if you are flexible enough to be able to enter into those imaginal realms, which are objective, have an objective component to them. I don't believe it's just all fantasy or all make-believe. Um, then I think you can uh, create a different range of facts than if you're just operating in a, in a sort of monocausal uh, frame of reference. And so I think we're, we're learning more and more to our frustration that we have cognitive access to very little of what's going on. And there's a great deal that are, somatically we're registering, but not at a conscious cognitive no. level. And we never will cognitively be aware of this and it's a good thing i don't want to know what my pancreas is doing oh uh, yeah exactly exactly, <laughs> exactly. Or, you know i want it to just work and so do its own thing in concert with the, the other organ systems in my body and i want to be off and running and reciting shakespeare you know and doing other things or riding a bicycle or or enjoying conversations such as i'm having today so i think that um this the 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 cognitive wins the grand prize, I think it's very, very foolish. 
and I think it's basically driven by this uh, by the fast mind um, as it tries to override the slower minds. And I think that's where we need to find how to how to work with that. And I'm also reminded of something, um, an interview that I heard uh, John Horgan. He's a He's the guy who wrote The End of Science. He's a science writer. He's a very popular science writer. And he interviewed um, Stuart Kaufman, who's a really leading figure in systems theory. And it was a, a tragic event happened in Kaufman's life. Uh, his daughter was killed by a car. And the thing is, he had had, uh, right before her death, he had had a vision of her death. And she died very similar to the vision that he had. So that very much freaked him out that he had a, a precognitive flash. And as a, you know, as a, as a biologist, he's a medical doctor and uh, he's a systems thinker. This uh, really challenged him cognitively. How could this have been uh, the case that he had had this, this, uh, and, it, and he had, it was, it was a tragic event. He, he had no, influence over um and i've had that i've had similar experiences um so i was had to call into question um a lot of things that i had taken for granted um, things that i can know and things that i can't know we can know a lot but we may not know how we know it and i think those kind of gut level responses and our some, sometimes visionary episodes uh can be presenting us with a diff different kinds of facts and I think he, he had a very persuasive, for me, sort of how he was figuring this out. Um, he says there's the possible and the actual. And in the, in the land of possibilities, a cat, the cat, Schrodinger's cat, remember, could be alive or dead. Um, but that when you lift the lid, you'll see a dead cat or a live cat because in actuality, it's either or. But in possibility, it can be both and, and neither nor. So he was sort of uh, saying that our logics are based upon ex the excluded middle. You know, A cannot be non-A. And if A equals B and B equals C, then C equals A, those kinds of, um, First order logic, which really dominates even now, 2,000 years after Aristotle, where a lot of these logics are still the way people are operating. But there are other alternative logics. And I think when we start to appreciate uh, the, the phase space that happens every night when we go to sleep and we wake up, we're going through, we're going into the twist in that Mobius strip. And the more of us who can do that, and stay awake, I think you, go, you start to realize that you have, there are different kinds of facts that start to emerge, and they're not based on the law of the excluded middle. That's, I think, a very narrow kind of definition that is good for a very limited range of things. And as we move into, I think, what a, a, a third order um, systems theory might, be, might become, um, which I think Gregory was... Uh, a pioneer of, and I think Nora is definitely in, in that opening up. And I think um, Robert Cohn is as well. You mentioned him, Al Forrest thing. Um, and I think um, certainly Timothy Morton. I think they're all working at this at this edge. So we're, uh, uh, I think that the, the possibility phase space is very, very real. And it's not just for fantasy prone people. And so I believe if you have a, this is a little science fiction, but I think there are people out there doing this. I believe if you hold an intention and you have a question and you pose a question from a center, then you, you have the, the field effects can start to happen. Um, and I think that that's important. And I think we've talked about this with, um, uh, uh, clean language is a way of working with this field. And I think um, uh, quantum poetics is also a way of working with the field. That if we are, if we can find that center and locate that center and formulate 
desired outcomes from that center, then we are less prone to the static and distortions that happen when we're being force fed information from nowhere about nothing. Uh, and I think that we need to get really, really in touch with our, with a sense of agency, but an agency that is not based upon first order cybernetics, where I'm over here, you're over there, you have something I want, I'm going to arrange circumstances so that I can get it. <laughs> you know? Which is basically what our politics and our businesses have, the way they've been run um, until fairly recently, I think, as, these eco as the ecology of our minds starts to become front and center in our tensions, I am sure that this will start to change. And, as, and we're already seeing evidence of that change, as I mentioned, uh, that the fact that New York State has gone green and that other states have gone green. And I think that will be a new trend. It, it's going to be lots of change. And um, going from micro to macro and meso in, in, in a bewildering array of uh, events, I'm sure that are going to happen. So I think the space space, the possibility and the actual and the different logics, I, uh, I think we're gonna to have to become extremely flexible. So thank you for giving me this chance to try to put this into words. Um, did you wanna say something, Jeffrey or Doug? No, no, um, As I was listening to you, uh, John, um, some of the things that I was, um, kind of um, came up in me is that I have a feeling that I have a long time ago acknowledged we are living in the imaginal. It's just a matter of how have we blocked it off. It's not, it's not, it's not a matter of, it, it, we've separated it out for a lot, all the reasons you said, the first order and stuff, but it's there, that's the center. That's the middle, and it's very real. And so a lot of my way of working is stop doing that to yourself. <laughs> but I have to be gentle on myself, too, because there is a, a just uh, a, maybe a, just a kind, a gentle on myself that maybe I'm not ready to totally go into the magical at certain times. Right. You know, right. And no one is ready. You will never be ready. This is what I caution people. If you're going to wait until you're ready, forget about it. It's coming at you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Life but, is coming at each of us, and it's not going to be on our terms. Well, and I appreciate that. But it seems like in listening to you, you've elevated your way of relating to the imaginal that's, that's kind of not about it it's not a readiness that i'm going to be certain about it but it, it's like learning how to surf <laughs> you know you've surfed right. in the marginal that there's no uh readiness that is uh without uncertainty that's right and these imaginal spaces are very destabilizing and i don't recommend them to everybody exactly but, but those uh but a lot of people i think are trying to um put uh, new wine into old yeah. wine stains. Yeah. And I, I confess that, you know, I would rather keep all this visionary stuff to myself. Uh, I don't particularly relish self-disclosure. It makes me as uncomfortable as anybody else. But I yeah. also know we're running out of time, people. We're running out of time, good people. We need to start telling all of our stories. Yeah. And telling them, you may have to tell them, like, Emily Dickinson says, I tell the truth, but tell it slant. <laughs> yes, 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 that's right. That's you may right. have to tell it a little bit crooked to get it across. But right. I have, we have a responsibility, I believe, to uh, tell the truth, tell it maybe in a way that other people, uh, you know, we have to find a way of getting our ideas across. So we need adequate translations from these trans in order to create transformative conditions, we have to be able to adequately translate. And right. I, I find myself under some kind of pressure because of Doug. Doug will come up with something. He may have noticed something that I was reading or something that I was thinking about. And he'll like, oh, let's do a cafe. And I went, no, 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 no. I'm not ready for this. <laughs> and he's already said he's going to do it. And I said, okay, well, if this is going to happen, I have to do some homework. <laughs> I didn't really want to do, but I will do it 
because I think we're creating a forum and, and it's very destabilizing because I don't have a, an adequate enough theory for all of the different kinds of experiences that I've had. And I'm sure you guys don't either. You all had experiences, wide range of them. And some of them are going to be probably loony and paranormal and very idiosyncratic just to yourself. But I think uh, as Reggie Ray, a Buddhist teacher that uh, Michael and I both uh, respect, I remember him saying, you know, we got to tell our stories. Yeah. yeah. No one else is going to do this for us. And yeah. we are narrative driven animals. We right. need stories uh, or we don't function very well. And our theories don't make any sense if we don't have a, of enough of a, a network of narr narrators to make, to make sense of our theories. And uh, so anyway, that's my you, spiel. You, you shouldn't well, blame Doug entirely because... Uh, um, <laughs> well, I blame you too. I wasn't ready to do this Bates <laughs> thing either. I, I wasn't ready happen. to do the quantum poetic stuff and we got kicked forward on that one. And, and the 20 year plans either I wasn't ready to do. So, I mean, I think we challenge each other all the time to right. move forward faster than we might normally do. That's right. Uh, and, and that's part of the, so it's not just being challenged. We are challenged all the time, but we're being challenged to, to give a little bit of a push to some of what we're doing. Right? That's right. And I love this idea that we're doing the axial age. Basically, uh, T TJ was initiated this. And I, I joined him because I had actually read the book and uh, a few years ago and had promptly forgotten about it. But it's important work. But you almost have to have a team of people who are dedicated to uh, taking it to another level. Because like you said, you can read the book on your own and enjoy it. And there's no pop quiz and no one's going <laughs> to say thumbs up, thumbs down, you know. And I think how do we re-educate, how do we educate ourselves or, and re-educate ourselves if we're not in a community of people who are creating a challenge outside exactly. of academia? If you're not going back to school, then you're going to have to find, create a school of your own, which is what I think we're doing. Yeah. Well, that's I, like tech, tech, no, sorry, Doug, go ahead. No, it was me. I, I was just going to say that I just finished. Uh, we we're just in the final stages of rereading Dune, but with a group. Wow. I want to read. I have read it oh. maybe six times, but I don't oh. think I understood it before. Wow. <laughs> wow. I was just going to quote Technot Han of saying that it's going to be a Sangha that we need not one individual Buddha or Jesus Christ or anything else. And that's one thing Michael Mead from a mythological is saying, instead of clinging to the hero journey of having a hero, which he's not that he's not totally dismissing it, but he's trying to come from the place. And that's what I like about him is each person within their soul has something to give to what's happening right now and he wants each person to honor that he calls that spark genius within them and we need more genius coming from multiple ways rather than a hero to save the sum total of mankind it's a it it, it it's not doesn't mean totally dismiss it but it's not serving us it, it we need something more than just a hero we need what we're doing here. That's right. Uh, I also wanted to come back on your thing about uh, literature, um, Johnny, because like you, I have my worries about where literature is going in the fragmented landscape that we have today, which we call, I mean, in some ways, the, the multiplicity of it is very interesting. But literature in the old sense is disappearing and being replaced by something something else which is some sort of polyglot of these different modalities and uh, it's not quite clear what is actually going to set forward into that midst or muddle or whatever it is right so um didn't ursula Le Guin have a comment about that too uh gregory uh, Jeffrey, um, yeah, Jeffrey. I think she, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think she did at the end of her life. She had a number of she had some. She was very, um, very uh, 
outspoken uh, person at, uh, towards the end of her life. And yeah. had a lot to say about the world. So, Yeah. And literature, I, th I just remember reading a piece of kind of along the line. That's why I asked you, because I thought maybe you read something from her. Well, I'm thinking of Rushkoff, Douglas Rushkoff, who talked about we live in a culture of label and dismiss. Oh. And, and I, I was just reading um, um, being, being ecological, Timothy Morton. He was talking about, um, you know, he's, he teaches around the world and he says the way people learn in, or process in like Paris is very different from Hong Kong, very different from uh, California. And uh, he was talking about these different styles and how he has to sort of adapt. And he says when he's in California, for instance, he always gets the feeling that his audience, they all have a, a remote and they are getting ready to change the channel. No shit. <laughs> Thank you. I live in California and that's true. Oh, you live in California, so you get it. He, oh, he God. Said, you have New York. I have California doing this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and you get the feeling like you're just getting ready to say something interesting and you look at someone and they're getting ready to change the channel. And I think, how can you create literature when attention spans are about five seconds long? <laughs> and I, I appreciate uh, this kind of tension. And because writing a novel or a poem is a labor intensive. Yeah. And, and, and physical, it. you know, it's physical. I mean, it's the other yes. thing we're talking about the imaginal, um, Michael, um, and it's not that I don't think of the imaginal as also having a physical component, but okay. it's in the tension with the physical, the imaginal. And I'm, I struggle not so much to keep the imaginal alive in my life, which I don't have too much difficulty with, <laughs> finding the equilibrium between ah. the imaginal realm and the physical realm, which have to talk to each other in order to function properly. That's in a good both, point, Jeffrey. In both that's directions, a, right? That's a good, and that's I a good find point. that 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 a challenge all the time. I think I think that's what I meant by adequate translation. Can you translate from the imaginal to the cultural space and then back to the imaginal? And what's that interplay like? And um, I think metaphors are going to be crucial. Uh, we all we know so much of our cultural lives are, are run by metaphors, and some of those metaphors we've outgrown and don't work anymore. But I think we're still using them, and until like um, you know, war. The war metaphor is just about in everything: uh, the war on drugs, the war on poverty, the war on cancer, and what would happen if we? What's another kind of metaphor? It's very hard, just like path dependency, we get attached to gross national product or fossil fuels. Uh, we get attached to certain metaphors um, right. that have outworn their usefulness, but we don't have anything to replace them with yet to well, redirect yeah, well, our attention. We can sew, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and sewing is a physical activity. Yes, right. But it's also an imaginal activity. Yes. And so this is right. one of the areas that I work on in order to, to make that balance, because writing, yeah. Although it's physical, um, you're more in the imaginal than you are in the physical when you're writing. Although you can't neglect the physical. No, you uh, can't. But, but, no. but for fashion design, you have to be in both worlds. Uh, and so I, that's why I like the fashion. Uh, yeah, this, this hands-on act, active mode of interacting. Um, I, I've personally had experience with the troubled youth I worked with. Um, my wife and a few others put on a crocheting they learn to crochet and there's these gang members that some of them more so involved than others, but they're sitting there crocheting, talking about their life and problems and stories or disagreeing with one another, whatever, whatever it might be. But it, it, it got themselves out of their head into the space right in front of them. And it, it's like they're creating their life right in front of their eyes. And, and it affected the communication as well. And, yeah. and I think I wanted to go back to, we mentioned love and accepting um, different forms of love. And that's why I love you guys. I can't always say it at the end of a call. I'm, I'm not 
there when when somebody says i love you i'm like ah, hold on a minute i've got to think five minutes what you mean there <laughs> um, and i don't want to just throw it out there but I, i've said it before and I'll, i'm saying it now i love all of you here and for the simple reason and we're getting better at it of correcting each other of prodding each other in the right or or wrong direction but prodding each other to rethink what we thought and we're, we're not having any psychotic breakdowns here um that's something maybe well, we've I always we, I, i've had a few psychotic breakdowns <laughs> but i've got i've always bounced back i think that's the difference between i think someone who's um has uh, a breakdown and a breakthrough i think it's hard to tell sometimes um, mm. a breakthrough will often feel like and look like something very distressing when it actually is something that's very creative. And I right. think it takes a great, great deal of sensitivity to know the difference. And I think you're very good at that, Doug. I think you, you're, you're appreciative of, the, of that difference. Right. And we've, we've built upon that support we've given to each other. And I think um, going back to this, this California mode of uh, amuse me or I'm changing the channel, then that, that's the YouTube culture, that's Facebook culture, and more and more individuals as they interact online from all around the world, experiencing different ways of interacting. Um, we are forming this, this kind of online discourse and it's going somewhere. Perhaps we're just a small pocket. We're not the right necessary pocket for everybody, but th there's something forming here and I think there might be a flip occurring in some sort of sense at some point that once this whole superficial side or surface side, it, it can tap into receiving the other um, in a much better manner. Yeah. Um, I posted an, uh, a video of somebody working with stones that uh, as tools from Indians and this goes to the notion of hands and thinking. John, you brought it in too, how our use of hands and stuff and, and bringing in the, the, I made a point of, if you look at the way is that the, uh, the picture of his hand, you have the digital, but the analog, you know, if you look at the hand with the fingers and there, there, there's a unity that we've forgotten that I think Gregory, or at least I'm using Gregory's thought to think about, of yeah, we have fingers, but we have a hand, and there's an analog that's connected to the di digital and stuff. And and one of the things, you know, a lot of people want to use the metaphor for metaphor as a bridge, but metaphor is a tool. And the whole thing was, we shape our tools, and thereafter, our tools shape us. I think that's something that we're talking about here: brain, giving attention to that dynamic and it, both its healthy and unhealthy applications. Because when I listen to some people talk, I have to be careful with my sensitivity that the metaphors like, John, you, you use war. I, ooh, I got to watch my sensations when people use war and trying to talk even just simple problems between each other, you know, the, metaphors that they use to talk about our problems sometimes uh, i i have to kind of, i have to what kearney says i have to get tactful of well i, I i'm not going to attack your metaphor but i'm going to come at it in a slanting way because i think it's a problem the way you're the metaphor you're using to help us communicate about the problem that's right that's right and that's why i i, I appreciated our conversation of um few weeks ago on um, Kearney's idea that um, about God the Father and I'm yeah. very happy to retire that metaphor God the Father does not work for me and God the mother does not work for me either I think God the parent is something that humanity needs to retire mm -hmm. and I do find that doesn't make me an atheist though it just means that metaphor doesn't work and I don't think it works for a lot of people but that means we have to sort of come up with other metaphors. And I thought the idea of God as the stranger, God as the orphan and the widow. The big the, other, the big other. Yeah, yeah those, those metaphors, that works for me. Yeah, Certainly sure. God is the stranger because 
most of my, once the cognitive, once I, I, I realized that my cognition has access to so very little, the vastness that my cognition has no access to is the stranger. Yeah, and I love, I love what you're doing with your hands, you and Doug, uh, and you brought our attention to it, and I've been paying more attention of how in these dialogues we use our hands. It's a uh, dance. Jeff yeah, and Jeffrey bringing up example of the tools that he used, you know, our hands, and, and giving attention to that, not just to the hearing, because the hands, actually for me, when I see people using hands, I actually have a physical sensation of touch, of being touched, you know, uh, but still we're separate, you know. <laughs> that was good, Doug. <laughs> that would, reach out and touch somebody. I, I think that's another direction. I, um, I don't know if you two mentioned the Jeffrey or, or Gregory here, um, that we, <laughs> we, John led us in a, a community, Cosmos Community Theater. And that's perhaps the closest we can come to using our bodies in this online cult culture. And I think that's, we, we've talked about it quite a bit. We, we used, used our head to talk about the body. <laughs> um, but it, it does matter what space we're in. We're usually all relaxed comfortable in our, our seat that's I'm sorry almost I, going I'm yeah, go sorry ahead. i missed that i'm really sorry oh. i missed that we'll we'll do it again i'm sure we can find a good role for you <laughs> we don't do enough shakespeare shakespeare has been uh, is another neglected um, Usually field neglected. of the literature i'm uh, i'm poignantly reminded also of something timothy morton said he was giving a lecture to some students i think it was in california to that crowd of people that he felt were getting ready to um, uh, delete the remote. <laughs> yeah, they, they were getting ready to change the channel. But he asked a question, I, he, he was teaching media studies or something like that. And I think the com they were talking about music and evolution of different kind of compositional styles, whatever. But he was talking about the history of the piano. And he asked the crowd, uh, does anyone know anything about the history of the piano? And from the back of the, of, the, of the classroom, a woman said, why should I care? Oh, wow. And he said he felt like he was speechless. He felt like he had, someone had slapped him across the face. Yeah. And I appreciate that. And I also appreciate, for some people, the history of the piano is just not part of their research program. Yeah. Um, but I think there's a, a, a tension there. And... And I'm reminded of that uh, that video that we we studied and we talked about in uh, one of our cafes with with Jordan Brown and uh, one of the commentators. She said, uh, "Do you we're, we're rapidly creating a culture where there are, there are lots of adults who don't know who Hitler was, uh -huh. and what what does that mean when you're living in a world with people who don't know who Hitler was?" And I worry because uh, if he was he. Uh, Morton was worried about those who don't know the history of the piano are not going to understand a lot about music because a lot of about a lot of his, uh, music has emerged out of the changes in the piano from harpsichord to pianoforte to piano to our modern baby grands you know or these big big concert hall pianos um, and also not to mention our, our technology for recording music and playing music but I think uh, Shakespeare it horrifies me. I saw a brochure that said the newest thing in Shakespeare. And I read that it said it was an advertisement for this. Uh, they're updating Shakespeare uh, into contemporary, they're translating into contemporary English. And I thought this is horrifying, horrifying. Hey, yo, Romeo, what's up, dude? I just think that is the, was the ugliest thing, idea anyone has ever come up with. When you have these glorious texts that no one is reading, but they think they need to update it to make it relevant to contemporary audiences. I think that's suicidal because you don't know. I, I don't, don't know, know, Tony. Um, West Side Story is a, is an update of Romeo and Juliet. I would not say so. No, but it was, it was written as, uh, you know, and it's been done several times and it's not always wrong. 
It's wrong if you replace Shakespeare with it. I think, I think that to be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune to take up arms against troubles and by opposing them in them. It's not the same thing as, do I want to kick the bucket or not? And I think that's a very fatal error. If you think you can translate all that complex metered speech into something that's going to be relevant to me today, walking down the street in New York. Now, I love the West Side Story, but I would say that's not trying to replace Shakespeare with something else that's more and better effective than Shakespeare. The West Side Story is a different, is a work of art that's unique to itself. Yeah. And it's drawing upon a rich theatrical tradition, but it's not trying to replace Shakespeare. Just as Shakespeare was drawing upon a rich theatrical tradition, he was drawing upon Seneca and, 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 and you know, Plato and, and all kinds of chronicles, historical chronicles that came before him. He didn't come up with any of his plots. He stole everything. So I'm not saying that you can't steal from Shakespeare and, and do your own thing. I, I do make the claim that you can't replace Shakespeare. No. And I don't think we should even try. Certainly we can take inspiration from Shakespeare and we can uh, reshape the stories that he had reshaped. And we can continue to do that. And I'm all from uh, postmodern uh, takes on Shakespeare, innovative productions. I've been in several of them myself uh, that depart from the traditional ways of playing Shakespeare. So I'm not into uh, creating like a, a museum piece where you go back in reverence and just review like uh, you do at a museum, previous uh, stages of our development. Um, and I don't think we need to, you know, get into a, a kind of false debate about that because I do think it's a false debate. Um, I think that I think goes back to, you, you mentioned Timothy Morton trying to explain to his students the history of the piano and then he hears, why should I care? What, what's, what's the relevance here? So it come, in that situation, it comes down, like the piano is Shakespeare personified in a piano and in an instrument. And it, I didn't mean it as, as a bad metaphor there maybe, but the piano is as relevant nowadays as Shakespeare is relevant nowadays. The piano is a massive piece of art within our culture, within not every culture, but it, it needs to be known. And the fact that the history of the piano is not something that we should care about, then it comes down to how it's taught. So in, th in that case, Timothy Morton could have um, it pulled out a piano from on the stage or or something or just demonstrated with a passion so it comes down to at least in in my mind right now that this is only a minor element of what you two are talking about of of the why should i care it, it needs to be known why we should care <clears throat> but I mean, this tie, this ties into Bateson's uh, this is i'm being activated or tying this back into Bateson of his ecology of ideas and the flexible of ideas. Because ideas seem to be without time. There's a timelessness of ideas of, of like Shakespeare with Seneca. There's this idea, especially, and I'm probably being too reductive, so just challenge me on that, but the idea of the human condition in different forms and how it plays out. And you have philosophers talking about it. You have creative people using language like Shakespeare or today. I, I kind of fall on the, the line that I wouldn't go attend somebody that's translating Shakespeare into hip hop. I, it would be hard for me to do that, but I would, uh, well, I was, uh, I was driven to entertain Shakespeare because of West Side Story, let's put it that way, to get the background, you know, uh, even though it was in a way, and this is my feeling, kind of a, a, a riff off of that, what Shakespeare wrote about, but trying to put it in today's time, you know, for people to, I think the inspiration is to um, bring Shakespeare to the public in a way that 
is translatable, John? <clears throat> well, you can do whatever you guys want to do. Okay, okay. <laughs> you don't need my permission. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in the possible and the actual and what we choose from our understanding of history and what we want to amplify uh, and what we want to evade or avoid. Um, right. What do we want to carry forward and what do we want to drop? And I think that's going to be idiosyncratic for some of us. It's just going to be up to me to decide what that is for myself. True. <clears throat> but I think collectively we can't, you know, we're not, um, no man or woman is an island unto themselves. And um, um, culture is about uh, all of us together, making, trying to make sense, and then maybe make meaning if enough of us make sense. And I realize that for a lot of people, Shakespeare makes no sense to them. Uh, and I think that they've, they've had a lot of bad, edu their educational system has failed. Um, but I also think literature is in really, really big trouble currently. Um, when uh, Shakespeare is so little understood. Right. I think that it, there is a performance tradition and there are a lot of actors who love Shakespeare and who will uh, subsidize the theater um, so that those productions can be performed. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, because it's not a big profit maker. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, theater, you know, because it doesn't make a profit and isn't subsidized, in this country particularly well. Unlike in Europe, a lot of theater is subsidized there uh, and, and flourishes. But I think that um, uh, the lack of institutional support in this country makes certain kinds of theater impractical. Uh, so the big blockbuster musical, um, you know, most of what happens in the commercial theater in New York where I live is extremely boring. And you would have to pay me a lot of money to sit through some of those. Um, but I, but you know, tourists from all over the world, they they love that kind of shit and fine. But you know, I've seen great actors, and there aren't that many of them left. Many of them, and it has a lot to do with the voice, because everything is mic'd now, and you have a microphone really close to you, and you don't have to project. <laughs> project. You don't have to amplify. Yeah. You have to carry it to the back row. Then you have people say, like this young lady did when he said, um, does anyone know the history of the, uh, of the piano? Well, sort of like, you know, do you know the history of the human voice? Do you know where opera comes from? <laughs> you know? And I know of a, a, a friend of mine is, a, is an opera singer. And she lives right across the hall from me and I hear her practice for many years. And, um, you know, she, she's, uh, taught at Juilliard, but she says there are a lot of people who want to sing opera. Not many people want to listen to it anymore. It's definitely gone out of fashion. The big yeah. days of the opera is pro probably over, <clears throat> but there are some people who crave that sound. And there are lots of people who want to perform it. So it may be kept alive, just like reading, by a very group, small group of people who just do it because they love it. And it, I think it's going to it's going to take a monastic turn, perhaps. There may be some people who just love it so much that they will yeah. give up a lot in order to do it and yeah. to find others who, are, who can be comrades. Um, like this, the Axial Age project uh, that we're trying to get, kick off the ground. It's like, well, how many people out there who really just love history, you know, especially something is like the history of religion. And um, this is not a big blockbuster. It's not going to make big profits for anybody. No. Uh, but those who do are attracted to it are very attracted to it. You're doing <laughs> so that I, tomorrow, right? You yeah, we're doing tomorrow. it tomorrow. You're all welcome. Yeah. Um, and what, uh, time, it's a, what time tomorrow? One o'clock. And we're working on, um, and you don't have to read anything. It's sort of an introduction. We're doing okay, tomorrow. okay. Um, That's the Eastern time, so that would be 10 o'clock my time. Uh, yes, yes. It's, it's posted. I, I think TJ just posted something yesterday yeah, or last night. Yeah, I can't but, know, I'm but I think that's the function we perform for each other is, you know, we're, we're trying to keep alive uh, certain, certain traditions of discourse. Uh, and I believe many of us are drawn to these kinds of opportunities here because our discourse sucks. Uh. 
I've never seen our discourse at such a low level as it is yeah. now. And I, I do want to do the best that I can and to sponsor others. And raising the level of our discourse even a little bit could make a, a huge uh, impact. Well, John, I just want to say yesterday's uh, community theater and the questions you asked, you know, uh, if you remember, it played into the notion of voice and voice for me coming from three important centers, the gut, the heart and the head, those three centers. Well, each of those centers, if I can put it this way, the voice is different. That's right. And then there's also, I'm just thinking of this right now, then there's a voice that integrates all three. That's right. That's and so, uh, and, and one thing I, I valued and I challenged myself for reading Shakespeare because when I read it, I, you know, I'm going over and I'm going, oh, well, how do I pronounce this? How do I, you know, uh, it, but you, uh, I kind of worked with it, but you uh, brought online the notion of the rhythm, which really helped me pace myself and uh, little did I know how much how to use a comma <laughs> for your speech <laughs> that's right that's so uh you know I just yeah I totally get where you're coming from and I, I value it I guess I I use what you're saying of how to listen to other people that are using language just ordinary language different than I how they're using their language to talk to me and how I have to interact with that because, you know, even like on so many levels, but just with my son yesterday, when I went to lunch, there was these moments that I, and I just came from that cafe of, I was in a good place to feel the tension of, he was saying something that I had a visceral response and, and, and I almost jumped into it and I, nope, let him finish. <laughs> You know, because his words, what he was trying to express were, I, I was, I had a sensation that I had to monitor, give attention. I don't need to respond in this situation, in this time. Maybe another time I would have said, what the fuck are you saying? <laughs> you get my drift? <laughs> I do, I do. So, so rehearsing Friar Lawrence actually <laughs> yeah. stabilizes your system. Yeah. It was, it, 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 it was so... Uh, imaginable that it was, you know, a father and son or friar and, and you know, that kind of dynamic. <laughs> so very well uh, appreciated. Well, if you do another one, let me know because I'd love to do. Uh, oh, yeah, we'd love, we'd love to have your voice. We have yeah. all these, we have all these baritones. Actually, Michael, I think you're more of a bass, but I think uh, we need to have a, a few sopranos to really make it a balanced organization. <laughs> Perhaps it, it could be introduced, not, not as the writer's underground solely, but as a sub-project, like reading each other's works. And well, I think Mary think might know. be interested. I'll, I'll mention it to her. There's uh, our soprano. She likes reading <laughs> aloud, so. Well, 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 yeah, well, Juliet would be a good role for her. Yeah. <laughs> just wanted to say a brief thing going off of what's been talked about it the rhythms and i'm imagining different times of day and stepping into those rhythms and and other people's rhythms even within the voice it's a physical thing too we're receiving whether through headphones or or the space around you we're receiving each other's speeds and uh, tone of voice and, and the myriad of other aspects of just these sound waves coming at us and that's something to contemplate there too or at least i'm contemplating i don't know how to further that thought but. <laughs> well we're coming up on the end of the hour of the two hour slot so um i don't know it was rather a freewheeling discussion maybe a little bit less about bateson and a little bit more about although michael you made a valiant attempt to bring bateson back in you know he was he was he was whispering in my ear and, and I, I do think you're right this issue about um literature and and uh 
the expertise has something about flexibility in it. It, it, it is a relevant comment to make. I'm not quite, I need to think about it a bit more in terms of what uh, the ultimate, what, what the ultimate impact is. But because I, I, I take your point, Jen, Johnny, as well. Um, I may have come out rather strongly against you, but I'm actually think we're more in agreement than in disagreement on the issue. But uh, Well, I think there's a, um, I think uh, I, there's a positive intention. I don't think you were objecting to anything I said, but I think there's a, a if you were objecting, I think there was a positive intention behind that. I don't know if I responded yeah. adequately to what that positive intention could be. Um, <laughs> but it's a lot about guessing. Um, but I think we, we both have a one foot in tradition and one foot in what's happening now. Yes. And, and I think that's important that we not try to be hip and cool too much and forget about those traditions or reject them uh, in favor of those who don't think the, the history of the piano has any relevance. Um, so anyway, that's my two cents. And I also uh, would defer to you totally in, in areas of physics because as, um, you know, I'm not a physicist, but I just read tons of different physics uh, practitioners and I'm realizing from what they tell me and from what's happening uh, and when I read there's no big consensus about what physics is and what's going on now and but I would defer to you there if you, not if you know something else let me know <laughs> because I need to be <laughs> updated for sure so I, I I know there are experts out there I just uh, want to assist those experts in creating translations so that more of us can figure out what they're, what they're talking about. And um, I think that's true of every field of human endeavor right now, that there are certainly gonna be experts. Um, but I think the more the experts are just talking to other experts, um, the less the experts are going to know about their own discipline, because they're not talking to anyone outside of it. So I think that's the challenge, is how do we get enough span and enough depth um, to, to make um, these complex systems we're in viable. Um, That's so an anyway. interesting uh, point because I just read a piece by Kearney in an interview that he says there's philosophers, there's scholars, and there's thinkers. And he doesn't consider, he draws on the philosophers and the scholarship being the experts in a field. And fortunately, he has good relationships with them. But he just considers himself a thinker, <laughs> you know, he just thinks about these things and it's a, in a broad, like Bateson, very broad, you know, work. And, and when I read that, I'm going, yeah, that's kind of, I, I've, I've even told people when I get into conversations, they get not adversarial, but they get, you know, robust and, and a little bit uh, deep, as some people say, I said, well, I'm just trying to think with my whole body, not just one part of my body, whether that's the lower part or the top part. Uh, I'm just trying to think from a whole body, body mind perspective. I think that's a, that's something that maybe the 21st century is trying to bring online. And, mm. and to do that, we actually have to look at, bring forth uh, uh, like you're saying, John and Kearney says of honoring the traditions, not necessarily just lock, stock, and barrel. But there's some good stuff there in the traditions we need to bring forward in these changing times. Well, I'll briefly say, because I know we're running out of time, about uh, scholarship, philosophy, thinkers. I think there's also scholar activists. There are people yes. who are scholars yes. who are activists. Yeah. And I'm drawn to that group. I also, I think the, the category that I'm most drawn to is what uh, Virginia Woolf, Woolf called the common reader. And I think yeah, she wrote a I love that. I just read that. Yeah. yeah. From uh, Andrew. Yes, Andrew Fields. He's he's doing lit uh, theory and he he posted an article and he mentioned this. And uh, I actually have her she has a book called The Common Reader and she's very erudite about literature. But she's also writing for the common man and woman, not for a scholarly ivory tower few. For pleasure um, and difficulty. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, but but pleasure is yeah. primarily the motivation behind reading. Right. Even very difficult technical stuff, you can enjoy that if you right. have the right attitude. 
Yeah, you know, right. I think that's what Bateson has been. Uh, this Bateson encounter has been for me is about um, getting in touch with that common reader in each of us, because um, I think he was a he was very much in that tradition of he was a very complex thinker, but he had a he felt an obligation to adequately translate this in, into something that others could appreciate and use. So I think he. Uh, I, I feel expanded by spending time with you guys on bats. And uh, I mean, I my original was the mine and, like I said last week, is mine and nature necessary uni, unity being a seed. And I just feel expanded by participating in this uh, on steps to an ecology. Me too. Yeah, I might go back and read some of the other stuff on my own, but slower. I mean, this was, <laughs> yeah. this was not slow. This is not what fast, but even slower. <laughs> <laughs> even slower. <laughs> well, it's been a, it's been a great pleasure, you guys. Uh, I'm, I came in the middle, and I'm glad that that was okay. How about you, Doug? Do you have any final thoughts before we go? <laughs> not at all. Um, <laughs> I like where we're going. I, I, it might be an overload, but this combobulation. Um, Are you stable? <laughs> for the most part. I'm, I'm swaying <laughs> right now. I'm, I've got my own rhythm here. But That's good. You know, thank you, Jeffrey and, and John, for starting the momentum for this group and throwing it out there. So, look forward I to I must admit, it, it was it was the big chunk. I mean, I've got I had three bit, bits that I announced, and we're about to start uh, in a month reading Savitri, which is the third bit that I had put out there at the beginning of the year. So I'm going to get all three of my goals realized. Oh, cool! <laughs> that, that is great. That's great, and that's pushing me <laughs> because I will now uh, focus on Savitri, which has always been on my wish list. Just like Bateson has been on my wish list to reread. Yeah. So this has been a catalyst for but me. I, and I wasn't quite ready for it, but I thought, <laughs> well, when is this opportunity going to come again? I better do it now. Well, I must admit it was your interest, uh, John, that also uh, pushed me forward on it. Because uh, uh, as soon as I realized I had a, there was another Bateson fan, I thought, this is the time to do it. Yes. What is Savati, if you don't mind me asking? Savitri is the epic poem that was written by Aurobindo. So oh, okay. Aurobindo, okay. Uh, uh, we had another reading on Aurobindo on the Life of the Divine last year, but um, uh -huh. Savitri is a, it's, it's like an instillment of all of his thinking that went into the S, into the, the, the sort of, well, I, I don't know what you call the Life of, well, it's kind of a, well, it's not really a, a biography, but it's a, it's a it's a essay kind of of his life thinking and so forth. Well, Savitri is an epic poem, but it appears to encapsulate much of his thinking inside the epic poem, and so it's it's oh. inter and it's also partly well, no, I wouldn't say based on, but it's because it's actually based on Indian um, uh, Hindu uh, background, uh, okay. uh, but. It's also partly inspired by Milton's Paradise Lost. Oh, okay. And, and so there, so the, so we're also going to be reading Paradise Lost and some of and Blake's The Marriage of Heaven Hell and Walt Whitman. We're going to bring in to the discussion. That's right. Andrew, I think, wants to lead that yeah, one. Yeah, that'd yeah. be great. So, uh, so we're going to read uh, Savitri aloud every second week, and in the middle weeks, we're going to talk about Milton, Blake, and Whitman. And when is that kicking off? The third of um, end of July, I think. Uh, end of July. Uh, I think uh, Matteo said Matteo's going to lead the. Yeah. I, I think I need to actually. I need to make. I, I need to come out and make a firm commitment on the other part of it, but um, and set a date. So. Yeah, the the Savitri will have an introductory. Um, meet up, which nobody needs to really attend, but maybe it, it will get the logistics and uh, introduction to the text on, I think, the third week of July, whatever yeah. date that might be. 
and then he plans on starting it uh, in August, the actual reading, I believe. And I don't know how long it'll take. There's quite a lot. To... It'll be two years. Yeah. By <laughs> calculation. But it, so it'll be a long one. <laughs> that, that, that's taking into account um, only one or two, or no, maybe three or four gaps. So if there's holidays or something like that. Right. So. Right. It, it could go well beyond <laughs> two years. But I like this setup where there's no pre-reading, no required anything. You just enter the discussion or the reading. Exactly. You read the text discussion. and then you discuss it, right? A little bit. Then he wants to read it again after that, I believe. He wants to read it twice in the same session with a discussion in the middle, uh, which I kind of like as a format. Yeah, it sounds very, very good. Yeah. No and I and I I've, I've already plunged into I'm into I'm just finishing up the second um, canto of um, Paradise Lost out of twelve. Um, so um, because I I kind of needed to read ahead in order to lead the discussion. So um, and I have read the Marriage of Heaven and Hell of Blake. I haven't dipped into Whitman again, but. Uh, Probably maybe ask Andrew if he can direct us in readings in Whitman. Uh, obviously, I've read uh, uh, Song of Myself, and uh, although many years ago, and uh, I sing the Body Electric and a few things like that, but the longer poems. But uh, we, he may be able to give us some feed, some some entry for the smaller poems by Whitman. Yeah. That's very I, I exciting. Must be, I must be going. Um, thank Me you too. Again. Yeah. I, need to, I need to take a nap. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm I, probably going to pop in tomorrow, John. I'd I, like okay. to take a nap. Um, for the Axel Age, I can't make it. I have other commitments for my time. But well, it's a video. I think, I think the book is such an interesting endeavor. I don't have it yet, but... Um, I'm thinking about getting it. It's it's a bit of a cost to buy because it, it's not it's not like a twenty dollar book. It's like a seventy dollar book. So I got it at a used bookstore, so I lucked out. Yeah, okay. But yeah. It's worth the read, but I it's all on video. It'll be in the archives, so you can always look at. I know, it. I know, but I you know it, it's such an opportunity to take part if I can. So yes, I may do that, but not this Friday. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Thank, Thank you all. Bye, bye. Thank you for a wonderful winter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank and you. summer, <laughs> early summer. <laughs> Take care, all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, all. Bye.